So um, I'm going to start the lecture today with this cartoon. We're going to be having the first host pathogen interaction one lecture. And what we have in here is the helicopter mom, which has the latest in family healthcare, which is the infection detectors. And as you see in the cartoon, she's basically, stay away from the kid in the red shirt. He got the flu. <laughs> and don't sit on the bench. It's crawling with the cold virus. It's conjunctivitis, a stomach bug. Basically to the whole idea that microbes are everywhere. And no matter how many times we try to wash our hands, we cannot really get rid of them. So let's then start to think about disease. And let's begin to look at disease as a relationship between the pathogen or agent, us being the host or the animal, because any animal could be the host of a pathogen, and then add to that the component of the environment. And that is what we call the disease triad. So as you see in this picture, we have the host in one side, the environment on the other, the pathogen. The pathogen could be interacting with other microbes through pathogen microbe interactions. Remember current sensing, trying to fight for niche, et cetera, et cetera. That could affect the availability of a particular pathogen so what we're going to look is then at the vertices of disease. Um, each of the points is called a vertice, and they all have different influences on the uh, outcome of disease. So as you know, we call the pathogen the what? What is causing the illness? And as we're going to be seeing, the pathogens can be any kind of microorganism. It could be a bacteria. It could be a fungus. It could be a virus. It could be a protozoan. So all of those microorganisms are able to cause disease. And what are going to be the important things when we deal with pathogens? It's going to be their virulence. It's going to be the susceptibility to antibiotics that they may have. It could be the growth conditions that they may need, if they need to grow aerobically, if they need to grow in an intracellular obligatory parasitic relationship, like chlamydia. Chlamydia cells grow inside the cells. Tuberculosis grows inside cells. So all that is going to affect the pathogen. When we think about the environment, now we're thinking about where this is all happening. And the environment is not only the place where we are having, it's the favorable surroundings and conditions that are external to us, the hosts. So we're looking at external influences that can allow now a disease to progress or be transmitted. And here we have things as where we live. The basic part of the environment, you were here, for example, in the Central Valley of California, most likely you will not be exposed to dengue fever here because dengue fever is a pathogen that is happening in tropical environments. So you have that issue of the environment. But also think about socioeconomical conditions. Living in a place with high sanitary conditions where people have access to health care, where the socioeconomic context is beneficial and most people are middle class and they're not living in extreme poverty. And the availability of healthcare, all those issues are part of the environment. And last, we're going to be looking at the host, the who gets uh, infected. And the host could be any kind of organism. We're going to be more concerned with animals. So we're thinking about mammals, or particularly us as human. Um, but also, those of you interested in veterinary medicine, we're going to have a whole slew of animals that could be infected by pathogens and suffer. We all think about, I mean, I was talking to my vet here, we live in this temper, uh, in parvo, excuse me, in parvo country, she told me. It's like, you have to have your dog vaccinated because parvo virus, which causes distemper, is endemic to this area, and therefore it's super dangerous. So if you have your pet animals that we all love, you may want to make sure that they're fine. Plants can be the host. In the end. And we can have devastating and cultural consequences to having pathogens that affect plants. So now, the host is going to be that organism that gets sick. Let's think about us getting sick. But it could be also a carrier. A host could be a carrier that may or may not get sick. And we're going to be looking, for example, at gonorrhea. And gonorrhea, the majority of people who have gonorrhea are asymptomatic carriers. They do not experience illness but they still are the host to gonorrhea. We're going to see that the host may or may not know that they have the disease. Mary Mellon, 
uh, who was the person that we call Typhoid Mary. She was infected and carried um, the bacteria that causes typhoid, and she didn't know. She didn't have any <laughs> symptoms. And whenever she was cooking, she could she continued making people ill. But they were trying to control her and blame it on her. I said, but I am not ill. I, had, I do not have signs of this disease. I don't have the bacteria in me. So she would have had it in the gallbladder. Those of you who went to this conference, uh, the talk that we had, it, the bacteria um, also harvests itself in the gallbladder. So it's constantly shedding itself into the digestive tract. So they couldn't find it in her. So again, the people may or may not know that they have the organism. And then also when we think about host, we have to look also at the symptoms. And what are the important factors when we're now talking about a host? It's our genetic susceptibility. Every single one of us is genetically different, and some of us are always healthy no matter the worst flu season, and some of us just go outside and we get every single cold that comes our way, and we're constantly feeling crappy. So you have that. You have the behavior of the individual. So exposure to disease could be also influenced by behavioral context. People who drink alcohol, people who may use drugs, people who may just do whatever it is that may expose them, put them in greater exposure to an organism. Things as simple as going cave uh, spelunking, where all of a sudden you're running around like I did a couple of years ago in bad guano, and therefore now I have a bad infection of a fungus in my lung because I put myself through behavior, which is like adventure seeking, in the place where the microorganism that causes this lung infection lives. So behavior doesn't have to be simply drug use. It could also be other part. And of course, nutritional state. The last part that I'm going to bring up here is going to be the issue of time. Because again, you can be exposed to an organism, but it takes time for that organism to come to the tissue, colonize it, attach, colonize, grow. So we talk about all those four points in the infection process, and that is what we call the incubation period of a disease. And some incubation periods are very, very short, other ones are very long. Eight, uh, for example, is considered to have a very long incubation period. The flu has a very short incubation period. So time may also describe the duration of the illness that is going to take its course. And also the period of a person that is going from infection until that infection becomes an epidemic. So time can be any of those points. Now, when we think about this disease triad, the mission of an epi epidemiologist or medical community in public health is to now break one of these vertices. If you can remove the pathogen, you don't have disease. If you ameliorate the environment, you may reduce disease. If you strengthen the host by vaccination, you can then not have disease. So breaking one of those vertices in the disease triangle is going to disrupt that relationship between the environment, the host, and the pathogen, and therefore stop the continuation of disease. And when we look at how that can be done, I'm going to show you this other example of a uh, different representation of the triad. You can do it by interventions. You can have interventions based on the agent, the host of the environment that you're looking at. And those are shown over here in these boxes. For example, if you're attacking the pathogen itself, you may try to eradicate the pathogen. And we did that with smallpox. You can then try to genetically modify the pathogen, for example. If that's something that you can be used. That's happening now with mosquitoes, for example, where we try to genetically modify the mosquito to release it in certain areas so they spread, they can uh, stop the spread of mosquito-borne diseases. Um, in the intervention of the environment, you can increase sanitation, water quality, preventative services for people who may be exposed to disease, like in the case of HIV. You have preventative services with condom distributions or uh, vaccination. Housing quality improves um, the relationships with the environment. And when we talk about the host, we then think about treating or isolating the people who may have disease. We may think of immunizing and increasing nutrition. So that it will be interventions that are happening at the vertices. But as you see, there's also those lines connected in the vertices. So you can look at how to improve the host's environment access by education, changing activity patterns, or having quarantine. 
or you can try to improve the pathogen host access by protecting the host against the pathogens, educating the host against exposure to the pathogens and how the pathogen can be spread, and then have alternative procedures to prevent exposure to the pathogen. And then if you go into the pathogen to the environment, you can then, for example, remove the pathogen from the environment. If the pathogen is carried by a mosquito through what is called a vector, the vector is the creature, usually an arthropod, that can carry a disease, you can then remove that vector from the um, environment. So therefore, the agent and the environment are now broken, and you have now improved health in that equipment. And of course, of course, increased sanitation. So those are the main points that I want to bring you when we start to think about disease. And I want you to keep them in mind when we're going to be talking about this lecture and the next two. Because we're going to go through a lot of different diseases. Some are going to be airborne. Other ones are going to be human-to-human -human contact. We're going to be looking at vector diseases. And we're going to look at food and water uh, diseases. So in all those four cases, I want you to start to think about the disease triad and how the disease triad can be used to understand the propagation of the disease that we're looking at. Okay? So keep that in mind. So um, let's take a look now as the host and take a really bird-eyed view about immune defenses. And what I did over here is to put this portion over here, um, which is, as a member, the four points of infection the exposure, adherence, invasion, and colonization and growth. And we're going to see that the, our immune system, both in the um, innate as well as the adapted immune system, are designed to be able to tackle all these points. So let's take a look at that. So when we think about it, all of us are not sick every day. We have a set of defenses in place that are going to be able to protect us against particular pathogens. And those are going to be at every single one of these stages to prevent or lower down the exposure that we have to particular molecules. I mean, particular diseases, excuse me. So when we're thinking about it is that oftentimes our defenses are sufficient so we don't get sick. You may be exposed to a lot of different things. You may have a sniffle for a day, but you don't fall ill because of disease. So you can prevent the disease entirely. But however, when infections occur, you may go to a point in which the immune defenses of the host are sufficient to prevent the disease before the disease happens. But that is not always the case. At some points, the defenses are going to be overcome by the virulence factors that are part of the pathogen's arsenal, and therefore now they're not going to be effective to protect us, and at that point we're going to have illness. So we're going to take a moment to look at the two general branches of our host defenses, so you can get an idea about how these defenses are designed to help us in the fight against microorganisms. And I'm going to start by looking at the constitutive defenses, what we call as the innate defenses. So those of you who are taking immunology, pardon me for the really overall view that we're going to look at, because I'm just going to give you a really general overview of what's going on. And now, when we think about these constitutive defenses, we're looking at ways that are not specific, because they are always present and always on, and are designed to protect us against organisms at all times. So we always call them constitutive defenses, and we call that the immune, the innate immune system. Now, this is a set of general protections that are going to uh, protect us against invasion by pathogens, but also they keep our natural flora at bay. We have, as we discussed, we are colonized by microorganisms in our skin, in our uh, respiratory system, in our digestive tract, in our urogenital tract. Our immune system, this innate immune responses are keeping the load of those microorganisms in, under control. 
So they do not become problematic, and there we have our relationship with them. As I mentioned to you at a, in a different class, they are designed, uh, and we need them to have them there. But out of control, those microorganisms can cause opportunity infections. Now, the innate immunity, as I mentioned, doesn't have specificity. It is a general mechanism that goes and attacks everybody equally. And it does it by multiple different points. It has a cellular component, which are the phagocytes. Here we have the macrophage, that is the normal phagocytic cell that is running around in our tissues. I'm putting over here, these are the red blood cells, so you can have an idea of how big the macrophage is. And this is a lymphocyte right there next to it. So the macrophage is a very large cell whose whole purpose is to phagocyte particles. And that red blood cells get phagocytes by um, macrophages. Particles, microorganisms get recognized and phagocytes by macrophages. We have also other... Uh, cells that are necessary in the innate immune system, and those are going to be the natural killer cells, or NK cells. And I have the picture over there, I, I uh, shrink it down so the size of the red blood cells is equal, so you can see the difference in size between this huge macrophage here. Look at the nucleus, it's almost as big as this guy, compared to the natural killer cell. And the natural killer cell, as you can appreciate from this other picture, has granules in the inside. And those granules are pack full of effector molecules which are designed to kill target cells. Just in the same way that we learn about the neuron releasing the vesicles that it has in the neuromuscular junction to allow the neurotransmitters to go outside, a very similar mechanism is used by natural killer cells to release the content of those granules. The content is the thing that is different. But the granules get packed in the same way that we discussed in Bio 110 um, for the neurons. And a signal is required for the release of those um, granules. The other part that we have are going to be other barriers. And we talk about one called complement. And complement, it is a set of proteins that are part of a cascade. The cascade needs to be initiated by the presence of a pathogen. And it could be initiated either by having antibodies that can trigger the complement component or by having a repeated pattern like the peptidoglycan layer on the surface of a pathogen. What happens after the complement component system gets activated is the formation of the spores on the surface of the target cell. And those pores are huge. And they are designed to allow the leakage of the cytoplasm out of the pathogen. So we call that the membrane attack complex. And every single one of our cells is exposed to complement, but we have surface receptors that prevent the formation of these complexes on, our sur on the surface of our own cells. It is when we have problems controlling the activation of those channels that get constructed from tiny monomers and they go into the membrane of the cell that we have problem with complement. And that's going to be one of the cases that we're going to discuss today with Streptococcus pyogenes. So now, in that innate immune response, we're going to have phagosomes, like the natural, like the uh, macrophage or the neutrophil. We're going to have natural killer cells that can fight against viral infected cells. And we're going to have the complement proteins found on serum. So those of you working in lab, you always hear your professor going to heat and activate your serum. They get the bottle of serum and they put it at 50 something degrees to inactivate it. They are destroying the complement proteins that are present. So they do not destroy your cell because they can be triggered. They don't need to be triggered by a cell. They then cell will spontaneously form the pore on your cell and kill it. Go ahead. These cells are stained, but not by the gram stain. These cells are stained with an H and E stain, which stains cells blue and certain parts of them red. So they do not have, it's using a different dye, and therefore they're not part of the gram stain. But yes, they're dyed perfectly blue. Yeah, good question. 
All right, so that is the name portal. So think about the phagosomes and the proteins of complements destroying everything underway that is attacking the body. But we also have a second mechanism, and that second mechanism is the mechanism of the adaptive immune system. When the innate mechanism fails, now the mechanism that has memory comes into play. And the mechanism that can be trained to be remembered and induce that memory comes into play. And that is the inducible defense. And it's basically uh, the one that we tickle every time we try to vaccinate. Because we want to make sure that the body has a memory of the pathogen that we're using in the vaccine. So the next time that you actually encounter the actual bona fide pathogen that can cause disease, you have a much faster way to deal with it. And this adaptive immunity is mediated by two cells, mostly B cells that produce antibodies and T cells. So here in this little cartoon that I have here, you have your B cell. It has a surface antibody. Eventually, that B cell could be triggered to release that as a soluble protein, and it will go all over the blood, targeting the antigens in which it was designed to be to recognize. And it says over here, I attack invaders outside the cell. So everything is usually a soluble molecule. It could be a virus. It could be a protein on the cell, but in the outside of the cell. It could be a toxin that has been segregated, uh, secreted by a bacteria. So something that the, it could be having a protein-protein interaction. The antibody is a protein. It can bind another protein. It could be antibody against DNA. It could be antibody about polysaccharide, it could be antibody against a lipid. But the system gets trained to recognize it. So the B cell gets instructions on this is the evil antigen, this belongs to a virus, learn to recognize it, and now remember it. So the next time you see it, you can uh, launch an immune response. And the, we call that the humoral response. Here is your B cell with antibodies on its surface, eventually, again, this is an entire class of immunology in two sentences, gets educated and it differentiates into this plasma cell which secretes these antibodies. Those are the Scott's missiles that will go into the system looking and inhibiting the antigens. On the other hand, we have the T cell. The T cell is able to recognize the antigens in the inside. So intracellular pathogens like intracellular bacteria or viruses get recognized by T cells. So the T cell is designed to kill the cell that it is infected. So these defenses, unlike the innate defenses, are not immediate because you have that learning curve that needs to happen. Oftentimes it takes a month for an effective adaptive immune response. And that's why we vaccinate. Because if we give you the vaccine, and you spend that month launching an immune response against your vaccine, the next time now that you actually see the actual pathogen, that response happens within days. Because the learning curve of the immune system has been taken care of by the original vaccine. So that's why vaccination works. You try to uh, accelerate the speed of the adaptive immune response. Now, the other mention of this is the, the adaptive immune response is specific. A B cell that is making an antibody against an HIV protein, that antibody will not recognize another virus. That antibody will not recognize a bacteria. In general, they are ultra specific. So this is part of the education. One B cell recognizes an antigen on a pathogen. And therefore, our entire B cell reservoir is a combination of all the memory B cells that we had seen since childhood and being exposed to vaccination and natural exposure to pathogens. So we have all these antibodies generated to our antigenic universe. So it's very specific. And again, pathogens are going to have mechanisms to prevent the adaptive immune system from destroying them. They can cover themselves in proteins from our own body, like fibronectin. We have fibronectin in our system. Our immune system recognizes fibronectin as us, so it doesn't attack it. But you can see a virus, a, a bacteria, putting itself into a fibronectin coat to pretend that it's part of you. So therefore, the immune system doesn't tackle it. So there are going to be many mechanisms that the pathogens are going to use 
to prevent both the adaptive and the innate immune system from uh, destroying them. Now, when we think about our defenses in general, we're going to have our adaptive immune system, we're going to have our innate immune system, and we already talked about the barriers, our skin, the mucosa that we have in our intestines, the fluid flow of the areas in the intestine and the urinal tract. We have also, don't forget about those bacteria that we have in our skin and in our gut. They are protecting us because the niche that is present in the gut is, I mean, the, the real estate is very prime. So all the microorganisms in the gut already found their niche. So a new pathogen coming in has to fight with those organisms to establish a niche. So therefore, the natural flora is protecting us from pathogens because they are competing for the same environmental issues. Of course, we have vaccines, antibiotics, detergents, autoclaves, and traditional mechanisms. So all those things are part of the arsenals that we have to protect us from disease. And for every one of our arsenal weapons, you're going to have a pathogen that has a weapon to counter it. So as we discussed, go back to this figure, adherence, invasion, colonization. So the microorganism is going to have mechanisms for adhesion. It's going to have mechanisms for invasion. It's going to have those degraded enzymes that are going to use to destroy the tissue to invade. It's going to have the toxins, either both the endo or exotoxins, to produce to be able to get and destroy the tissue. Inflammation could be used by the microbe to destroy and allow itself to establish a niche is going to have ways to evade both the phagosomes and the antibodies that we're using to attack them. And of course, some of the byproducts that the macros are using are part of their arsenal. Think about gangrene. Gangrene is a disease in which the Clostridium bacteria that is producing the infection produces gas. Gas is what is destroying the tissue. So that gas production, or the production of acid by fermentation, could then be used as a way to alter the environment and therefore make that environment less acceptable, less, susceptible, uh, less accessible, excuse me, for the immune cells to happen. They're going to have their own resistances, resistant to antibiotics, because they may have an R plasmid, which has genes that allow them to break down, for example, the beta lactamase protein that breaks down the, lactam, the beta lactam ring on penicillins, or they can create superantigens to create a superantigen is a protein that binds to cells of the immune system and triggers them to such a way that they commit suicide. So if you remove the immune cells, um, therefore now you don't have to worry about the immune system fighting you. So for example, we're going to learn that um, Yersinia pestis, which is the bacteria that causes the bubonic plague, has a type 3 secretion system. Remember the ones that we learned during exportation of proteins? And that type 3 secretion system is able to deliver yolk proteins to the immune cells to kill them. So there you go, Yersinia binding to a macrophage, injecting it with a cell, with a protein that is going to induce apoptosis. So you don't have to worry about the macrophage coming in to swallow you, because you destroy the macrophage directly. So all of those are going to be mechanisms that are part of the virulence factors either encoded on a plasmid or encoded on a phage that are going to allow the microorganism to counter our defenses and our arsenal of attack. All right, let's begin now to talk about some of these microorganisms. And I'm going to start by looking at organisms that are transmitted via air. And this picture, I really love it because this is showing what this is showing a picture of the aerosol that it's generated when somebody coughs. Yeah. So as a person coughs, we tend to think that I can put my hand and that's going to protect you. It's like, no. As you're coughing, you are actually um, creating an aerosol of small saliva particles. I read somewhere, and I don't know how true it is, that some of those particles at the point of the cuff can actually go 100 miles per hour. So they are going really fast, but not for a very long place. But if I am here coughing my lungs out, and Anne is over there, 
That is sufficient for that particle to go and get to her. And if there is an infectious agent in that particle, now that particle carry the infection from me to her. And this is why a tissue or the elbow is the best way to protect yourself against the coughing mechanism. So as we discussed before, when we're looking at the respiratory system, we're looking at the upper respiratory tract, which is the sinuses, the oral cavity, and the pharynx, and then the lower respiratory tract, which includes the trachea and the lung. And within the lung, we have the primary uh, alveoli, we have the secondary alveoli, so the primary bronchus, which is the first division, then, like you see in this other side, you have the secondary bronchus, and at the end, you have the terminal bronchus, which have the alveolar ducts, which help us get the air that we need. When we take immunology, and we're thinking about asthma, an overreaction of the immune system here constricts those channels. They are like a tube. Imagine a tube of cells with an epithelium and an allergic reaction that causes asthma constricts that. And therefore, the flow of air, instead of going from a very nice, long, large channel, goes have to go now through a very small channel. There is muscle around the alveoli. And that muscle gets to be constricted, and that's why that vessel constriction is going to create the problem. So what we're going to be looking is that, depending on the area of the respiratory tract, we can have, for example, bacteria like Streptococcus pyogenes. We can have the small, the small, the cold viruses that are present in this area. And in the long part now, we can have influenza virus, for example, that could be acting up, or mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we're going to be looking at those four pathogens in a moment. So let me begin now by looking at the upper respiratory tract and Streptococcus pyogenes. And Streptococcus pyogenes is a gram-positive microorganism. It doesn't move. It doesn't form spores. And it likes to live in the upper area of the uh, respiratory tract. But it is the microorganism that can cause about five different diseases. And all of them are having a different course of disease depending on the location that we're talking about. So we usually think about strep throat. So here, um, strep from streptococcus. You look at the back of the throat, you have that area of inflammation and the white patches are colonies of bacteria present there. That is the, uh, one of these is caused by streptococcus pyogenes. Little children with nails, they like to scratch their little faces, that's why we put little mittens on them when they're tiny babies. But they still, they're touching a lot of things and they have streptococcus pyogenes in their hand, they can now get them and create these lesions in their skin that we recognize as impedigo. Impedigo can also be caused by Staph aureus, so it's not only streptococcus pyogenes. So multiple different bacteria can generate that. Streptococcus pyogenes, it's the main agent of the scarlet fever. Here you have this kid, uh, and you can see the inflammation on the skin, and that gives the name scarlet fever to the disease. And when we think about that generalized inflammation that you're having, it's caused by exotoxins, which are pyrogenic. These ones are fever-causing exotoxins, and Streptococcus pyogenes has four of them. The SPA, SPB, SPC, and SPF toxins. Last but not least, actually not last yet, we have, we're going to look at necrotizing fasciitis, which is shown over here. This person's arm, here's the bone of the elbow, and this is the, um, must be the radius, I believe, uh, over there. Look at the inflammation of the skin that has been caused, where the bacteria now is causing a generalized area of destruction in the fascia. And that is the subcutaneous tissue that is happening in the connective tissue, and it's a result of huge inflammation as well. Last but not least, which is the worst part of the streptococcus pyogeny, is the streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, or STSS. And that is actually a lethal condition that what we call is a cytokine storm. As I mentioned to you that it's adaptive immune cells, those B cells and T cells and macrophages, they are communicating with each other through cytokines. Cytokines are the immune system hormones. When they go crazy and begin to secrete those cytokines 
out of control because of the inflammation caused by the bacteria, we call that a cytokine storm. And the cytokine storm, in this case secreted by T cells, activated macrophages, or even granulocytes, it causes now systemic inflammation. This is localized inflammation right here, to this area. Systemic inflammation happens in, during the entire system. And it causes systemic inflammation, tissue destruction, and in half of the cases, death. So what is making Streptococcus pyogenes this versatile in the way of causing diseases? It is the phages that it is infected with. So now, Streptococcus, remember we discussed when we learned about phages about lysogenic conversion, which is now a change in the phenotype of a bacteria based on the temperate phage. Remember, the temperate phage is the one that can, like lambda, go and become lysogenic. It's going to go inside and in, in, um, integrate itself in the genome of the host. And those phages in their genome, they now encode the toxins. So depending on the phage that infects Streptococcus pyogenes, you're going to have a different pathogenic bacteria. So here, with those phages, as I mentioned to you, they're giving the uh, following advantages. The phage is giving now virulence factor to the bacteria, and that is going to allow that bacteria to be better able to proliferate in the host. The toxins are destroying the tissue. Now the bacteria has plenty of food in the destructive tissue. And they probably have created an area like a granuloma where they can actually live and prevent the immune system from coming in. You don't have circulation there, so complement doesn't attack you anymore. So you have a way of destroying that area. And that prophage is going to be maintained um, in the host as a selective pressure. As long as you have that prophage in your host genome, you are better able to infect. So now, depending on the phage infecting Streptococcus pyogenes, now you have phages that can give you Strep A, excuse me, SpA, SpB, SpZ, or SpHS toxins. And that is what's going to account for the very different diseases that the same bacteria can cause. So you have a variation, sometimes up to 71%, between strains of Streptococcus pyogenes based on the phages that are infecting them. So now, F. pyogenes also have other things besides the toxins and the phages of its lead. It has, for example, molecules that are going to allow it to better adhere. The M protein and the fibronectin binding protein called protein F are able to allow it for adhesion. And remember, being a gram-positive bacteria, it has lipotechoic acids on its surface as part of the cell wall. And those are also able to allow the bacteria to uh, adhere. And based on M protein alone, we have over 150 different strains of Streptococcus pyogenes. <coughs> now, hyaluronic acid, it is a molecule in connective tissue that collects a lot of liquid. And Streptococcus pyogenes can make a capsule of hyaluronic acid. Basically, it's now making a capsule of a protein that is ours, and therefore now the phagosomes doesn't want to swallow it, and therefore it prevents phagocytosis. We have invasives. Here are the proteins that I was telling you about that are able to destroy different proteins in the body to allow the bacteria to invade. And here we have streptokinase, which is going to uh, close plasmidogen into plasmin. Here we have like a DNASB, which is a deoxyribonucleoside, so it can cut DNA down, so it can get that. Here is the protein that causes, that cleaves the hyaluronic acid. And therefore, now the bacteria can use it to dress itself on it. And streptolysins, which are actually um, toxins. Those of you who remember in lab class, we talk about streptolysin O as part of the toxins that are able to uh, destroy red blood cells. So in the case of scarlet fever and streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, the exotoxins produce the rash that it's uh, seen in streptococcus pyogenes. And the other thing that is another way is now the issue of molecular mimicry. So Streptococcus pyogenes has evolved certain antigens on its surface that look very similar to antigens present in human cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscle, or in the heart valve of 
fibroblasts or in the neuronal tissue, as well as some of them in the kidney tissue. So now, when our immune system makes an antibody against those proteins, because they have molecular mimicry, those proteins can now bind to the heart muscle proteins, for example, because the antibody is not able to, though it's very specific, because of the mimicry, it cannot distinguish well between the bacterial protein and the human protein. And now the antibodies that we are making against the bacteria attack our own tissue. And that is the case of rheumatic <coughs> fever. So the antibodies that are made can accumulate in the joint tissue, cause a huge arthritis wave, or what we call the post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And glomerulonephritis is, again, an aggregate of antibody and antigens of the bacteria that get to the glomerulae, excuse me, of the kidney, and now destroy the kidney, causing protein, for example, to be secreted into the urine. So that kind of mimicry is a way to then try to attenuate the immune response because now you're damaging the tissue. So this is part of the issues that you get during streptococcus uh, disease. I put the tuberculosis as an extra slide because, I mean, the lecture became a bit big because I added stuff at the beginning. So I have two slides there for you, so take a look. So I'm going to talk about now as a virus, and I'm going to bring influenza and the cold viruses in here to discuss that point. So the common cold are, is caused by two families of viruses. The rhinoviruses, rhino, rhinoceros, you know the animal, but it's cold because it had that big uh, horn as a nose. So rhino, it's nose. So rhinoviruses, because we get the cold in the nose. And coronaviruses are both single-stranded RNA viruses that cause the common cold. And the problem with the cold is that there are too many. Uh, the last I changed, I went in on, online, and now we have more than 150 different serotypes of cold viruses. That's why we don't have a cold vaccine. We do not have one to attack so many of them. Influenza, on the other hand, um, it's a single-stranded negative sense RNA. It has eight chromosomes, type A influenza. We have type B and type C. And um, the conditions caused by the cold and influenza viruses are very different. For example, I'll leave this table for you to study more in depth for you, but I want to bring a couple of issues to point. If you have the flu, you have a huge fever. When you have the cold, you rarely have fever. If you have the flu, you feel like dying, and your general malaise, which is a state of illness, it's acute and terrible. You have very slight malaise with the cold. When you get the flu, you can barely move because every single one of your muscles hurt. And even laying in bed hurts. That is malaise. Nasal discharge, the mucus that we're constantly blowing our nose, it's common with the cold, but not common with the flu. So if you have fever, body ache that can last for weeks, and are you not discharging anything nor coughing, you got the flu. And the flu could be deadly. The cold, usually it's not. Now when we think about um, the flu, we're going to look that the flu is a virus, it's an envelope virus, it has a membrane around itself, and in that membrane you have two proteins. The hemagglutinin protein, that has a trimer, and the neuraminidase protein, it has a tetramer. And these proteins are extremely important to determine the kind of flu. Remember the H1N1. H1 for type 1 hemagglutinin, N1 for type 1 neuraminidase. So we're constantly checking out those proteins. Now, part of the defense of this virus is to change those proteins constantly. So that is called the antigenic variation. So you're constantly reshuffling the hemagglutinin and neuraminidin antigens to escape the antibodies that our B cells are making. And when you change those antigenic structures, you keep the function of them. But now, since the immune system is so specific, a slight, a slight amino acid variability in that protein makes it unrecognizable by the antibody. So that is a really... Um, good way to render the antibody response less effective. Oops, excuse me. I pressed the wrong button. Okay. So we're going to see that this kind of 
uh, variability happens in two ways. One of them called antigenic shift and the other one called antigenic drift. And this is antigenic drift. Basically, antigenic drift can be summarized as point mutations on the surface, on the proteins that are on the surface, that change the structure slightly without eliminating the function of the protein. So here, for example, you have this poor woman who gets infected and here is an antibody against this influenza virus. This is another antibody against this other influenza virus. So you see that the, there's an antibody response against all the proteins of this influenza. So she got protection. Now, because of a mutation in one of the eight chromosomes of the RNA of influenza, that protein that was beautiful like a bat, it now looks like a heart spear. That change in protein structure is sufficient, so the antibodies made against this protein are no longer able to recognize the other one. So those constant changes in antigens uh, allow the evasion of the B-cell response. The other one that we're going to be looking at, oh, before I go, um, this is the way in which influenza A, B, and C all can change the surface antigens. However, influenza A has another trick up his sleeve, and that is called antigenic shift. An antigenic shift relies on the capacity. Remember that viral table that I show you with pig, horse, human, and bird? Those viruses can infect multiple species. So what we have here, it's this blue influenza virus in chicken. We have this guy with the orange influenza virus. He's a farmer, let's say. So that's his chicken, and this is his pig. And because the pig is exposed to the chicken and exposed to the farmer, the pig now is going to be infected by both the influenza virus from pig and the, excuse me, the influenza virus from human and the influenza virus from bird. But because there's eight chromosomes in the flu uh, virus, when the cell that is infected is putting together the chromosomes back to release new viruses, it doesn't know which one came from the bird flu and which ones came from the human flu. So what you end up creating is hybrid viruses. And these hybrid viruses, as you can see here, can have some of the chromosomes that came from the human influenza and other the chromosomes that came from the bird influenza, creating a brand new type of flu that can now come and infect both people, like here the mom now is going to get it, and infector. So this is basically on the fact of the rearranging of the RNA chromosomes of the type A flu. So this reassortment is what the authorities are usually checking out to try to guesstimate what is going to be the next pandemic that is coming up. So they're following the flu in birds, following the flu in human, and then doing calculations to determine, oh, the next flu that is going to come is going to have H1 and 5, based on these calculations. And usually it works well. I, you probably remember about five years ago when it didn't work and the predicted flu vaccine didn't match to the flu that arose through antigenic shift, and therefore we were unprotected for that flu season. So this kind of antigenic shift, it is the reason why flu creates pandemics every year. Because the virus is constantly shuffling chromosomes by infecting, by two different strains of viruses, infecting a common host. Generating a brand new virus that can then dominate the next flu season. So you have antigenic drift, which is the point mutations happening on the neuraminidase or hemagglutinin proteins that now make that virus resistant to the antibodies that you make. And then you have antigenic shift where you are reshuffling the chromosomes of multiple flu viruses generating new strains. And most likely those new strains, the person that are getting them have no defenses against them. Okay? Any questions so far? I know that I'm going fast. I just want to make sure that I cover all the material. Now, let's now go to the sexual and direct transmission of disease. And here I have my hand. You have a pair of people holding hands very lovingly with one another. But what I want to bring, this is a, a, a sentence that I got from one of the World Health Organization uh, reports from 2013. 
we have about eight of the more than 30 pathogens known to be transmitted through sexual contact have been linked to the greatest incidence of illness. And of those eight, four of them are bacterial and four of them are viral. So the curable bacterial diseases are syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomoniasis. That is the only one, I actually, I, I misspoke. Trichomoniasis is caused by a parasite, which is a, um, it's not a bacteria. It's, uh, oh God, I'm blanking. Please somebody help me out of my misery. Huh? Huh? Yes, and um, the P word, protozoan. Thank you. Alzheimer's is hitting. So it's a protozoan. I tell you, I'm getting there. So um, the trichomoniasis, it's caused by a protozoan. Trichomoniasis vaginalis is the name of the organism. Yeah, now I can remember the name of the organism, but I can remember that it was a protozoan. Okay, the other diseases are viral, and as you may imagine, we do not have cures for them. So we're going to be looking at hepatitis B, herpes, HIV, and human papillomavirus. Of these, I have chosen only to look at hep B and herpes. And of the bacterial ones, we're going to look at syphilis and gonorrhea. So all right, hepatitis. Hepatitis is an acute disease of the liver, and it can be caused by multiple different viruses. So here you have an image of a healthy liver. And here you have an image of a psoriasis liver. We tend to think about all alcohol psoriasis. People that drink a lot get the liver destroyed. Viral um, cirrhosis is also the destruction of the liver tissue by viruses. The symptoms that you have are destruction of the liver. And because of destruction of the liver, you get a lot of bile. And that can cause jaundice. Jaundice, it's the yellowing of the skin because of the bile. The same thing is icterus, which is the uh, yellowing of the uh, eye. So um, last but not least, what we're going to look um, is at the uh, term of ascites. Ascites is the accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity. So this old lady, she's not pregnant. That is liquid that is accumulating in her abdominal cavity. So. All these procedures, uh, the last thing that I have to mention, many hepatitis viruses are carcinogenic and therefore can lead to hepatocarcinoma. So the first time that I actually saw a person with icterus, it scared the bejesus out of me because I was walking in London uh, to take the tube and this man, who actually very disheveled, walked to me with he, I mean, bright yellow eyes, as bright as a jazz sweatshirt. And I was with my best friend from grad school who had come to visit me in France. And I looked at her, it's like, did you look at his eye? Yeah, he has icterus. It's like, he has a really active hepatitis uh, disease going on. Because his eyes were that yellow. So now, we have five different viruses that we know can cause hepatitis. Hep A, B, C, D, and E. All of these viruses are different. Hep A, it's... Hepatitis virus A, it is a single-stranded RNA virus. Hep B is an orthohepatitis virus, which is a double-stranded DNA virus. So again, they're not really related to one another. They're very different species of creatures. One of them is sexually transmitted, which is Hep B. Hep A is transmitted through food. So food that is contaminated, or actually oral anal contact. That could also happen. Hep C. Um, hep D and Hep E are also other different kinds of flu, uh, flu viruses. We only have vaccines right now for Hep A and Hep B, though right now there's a brand new vaccine for Hep C which is being tested and checked out. And when you can look at this picture uh, over here, Hep A causes an acute infection that has been going up in spikes throughout history with the number of reported cases per 100. That is called the prevalence of, uh, of the virus. Now, parenteral viruses, like the ones over here um, with hep C, B, and E, those 
could be caused by medication or other substances that you get, like needles, for example. So infusion, injection, implantation. That will be the way to carry the stones. So to look a look, take a look, let's look at hep C. Um, it has a way to escape the immune system because it has proteases that are able to cleave the toll like receptor 3. And a toll like receptor is a pattern recognition receptor in the surface of immune cells that allows them to get activated. So if the virus is now producing a protease that cleaves that protein down, the macrophages and the cells in the immune system cannot get activated anymore. So that can limit the effectiveness of the immune system to fight disease. Hep B has antigenic variation. So you will have multiple antigens presented on its surface that now the immune system is like, wait, I thought that I made a launch an immune response against you. The virus changed its code, and now the immune system has to start all over again. And last, um, Hep V, for example, has um, ways to inhibit production of some of the effects of interference, which are proteins designed to alert the immune system against um, invasion of viruses in particular. So interferon inhibition, it's a really effective way to render the immune system completely flat. So viral can do this very well. Let's take a look at the, um, at the bacterial and protozoan um, diseases. And again, this table here, it's showing you all the sexually transmitted diseases and the guidelines that we have for infection. Take a look at them. In particular, I want you to bring your attention to gonorrhea, which is caused by Nasira gonorrhea. So you see a B next to the name that indicates like that it's a bacteria. And what is the kind of treatment that we're using? And this is going to be important because gonorrhea now is resistant to even the last resort antibiotics that we're using. So we are now running out of ammunition to fight gonorrhea. The other one that I want to bring to your attention is syphilis. Treponema pallidum is the bacteria that causes that, and you have a different kind of penicillin, so it's still really good to be fought. But look at the great amount of bacteria of diseases that are sexually transmitted that are caused by bacteria or by um, fungi. So here you have uh, genital herpes. We're going to take a look at that. Uh, actually, I moved that to the end of the lecture for extra for you guys. So that is a viral disease. Genital wart is a viral disease. Here we have trichomona vaginalis, which is the protozoan. Now I can remember the word. I won't miss it anymore. And multiple bacteria, for example, Neisseria gonorrhea, besides causing gonorrhea, it can cause also pelvic inflammatory disease. So it's a very different thing. Now, this graph over here, it's showing the reported cases per 100,000 population. Um, so this is looking at the incidence of either syphilis or gonorrhea from 1920 to 2015. And I want to discuss with you a couple of things. Um, check out. Here, what happened with World War II, huge increase in syphilis and huge increase in gonorrhea during World War II. What do you think that was happening? Good question. When it says in the U.S., does it mean those U.S. citizens that are also involved in coming back, or is it just with the patient cases in the U.S.? Patients and cases in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. So as the war was going on. Soldiers were either having sex outside um, with lovers in Europe, coming back home and being diagnosed, or uh, they were going crazy. So here what happens, it's the found of penicillin. And when penicillin was discovered, notice the beautiful <coughs> reduction in both uh, syphilis and gonorrhea. But something happened here with the, in the discovery and the introduction of the birth control pill. What do you think happened there? Huh? Food stock. <laughs> well, so what do you think happened when you introduce birth control? Sex freedom. Sex freedom, meaning? No condoms. Exactly. Since the condom was used to prevent pregnancy, hey, I don't have to use a condom anymore. So gonorrhea went up immensely. What is not being shown here is the spike that is starting to go up here as the cases of gonorrhea are coming up. 
So gonorrhea is caused by the bacteria in a serum gonorrhea, which is a gram-negative microorganism. In males and in females, it causes disease. In males, we have the event of the drip, which is the white exudate that is being secreted from the gland of the penis. But gonorrhea can infect the mouth. It, it can infect the women's urinal tract, the male urinal tract. It can infect the anus. So many different areas can be infected by gonorrhea. And gonorrhea, um, right now, has become resistant to even cephalosporins, which, as you know, are sort of the last resort medications. It is already resistant to penicillin, streptomycin, and everything else that we can throw at it. So now we consider a multi drug resistant organism. And in 2010, we reported more than 300 cases of gonorrhea in the U.S. That is a huge number of new cases of gonorrhea. Now, for time, I'm going to bring this up here. The issue with gonorrhea is that in both men and women, it can go asymptomatic, and when you're asymptomatic, you do not know that you have the infection. And that can cause the passage of the... It can cause two things. Number one, sterility in women. So many women become sterile either by syphilis or gonorrhea infection, especially if they're asymptomatic. And they can have now maternal to fetal transfer during birth. And here in this picture, what you have is a tiny kid whose eyes are shot because they have gonorrhea infection in the eye, which will lead them to blindness. So that's why when babies are born, the first thing that they do is to put this uh, antibiotic drugs in their eyes um, as part of the regimen after they live. So that's the ocular infection of gonorrhea. So not only is gonorrhea affecting the urogenical tract, but it can also affect the eyes. Now, gonorrhea is amazing in the sense that it is a jack of all trades. It can have what is called phase and antigenic variation. So now, a phase variation, it's changing proteins on your surface by either having them or expressing one or multiple proteins. The antigenic variation happens when you start to turn in genes off or on. So when we think about fimbriae, they need to attach to the walls of the urinal tract to those mechanisms. The fimbriae can change by both antigenic as well as phase variation. Now, gonorrhea has a particular protein that is extremely important for attachment called the OPA protein, OPA for opacity. And that protein allows it to bind to the CEA antigen or to the heparin sulfate protoglycans in the host cells. We think right now that there's between 11 and 12 different genes for OPA. So a strain of gonorrhea can express one gene of OPA, two genes of OPA, five genes of OPA. And that changes the variation on the surface antigen for the OPA protein. So that is what is called the phase variation. So at any particular time, if there's zero, one, or several different OPA proteins can be expressed. So now when we think about the difference between phase and antigenic variation, that is going to be the phase is the all or none. Either you have that protein or you, have, or you don't have it. And when you have it, it could be at multiple levels. When you think of antigenic variation, now you're thinking of proteins, like in the case of flu, that you're varying the... Um, amino acid structure of a protein, so now it's immunologically distinct. That is the big difference between phase and antigenic variation. Phase variation, you have the protein there or not. Antigenic variation is changing the sequence of the protein by mutations, by gene conversion, that can now allow that protein to evade the immune system. So that's part of this. So I'm, take a look at this slide in carefully, because I'm going to go for the last one. And let's talk about syphilis. So syphilis here is caused by triponema pallidum. It's a spirochete. Here you have it. And what it's going to cause is a chancre. The chancre, it is this lesion that you have on the area where the initial bacteria gets exposed. It could be a lesion in the mouth. It could be a lesion in the anus. It could be a lesion in the penis or the vagina. And initially, if you leave it untreated, that will go away. If it goes away on its own without treatment, weeks later, you can now have syphilis in the blood. 
that causes a systemic infection, and that is called now secondary syphilis. And secondary syphilis will cause lesions all over the body. So a huge rash all over the body, and the rash is basically the immune system fighting the bacterial infection. If that goes untreated, syphilis years later will come back with a vengeance as a tertiary syphilis infection. And that is the kind of infection that has neurological damage. It has gone now to the brain. It can cause blindness, insanity, and paralysis. Now, syphilis can kill about 100,000 people a year worldwide. And when we're starting to think about syphilis, here are some pictures of syphilis based on a secondary infection. So here's this person. Notice his back is completely covered in lesions. In tertiary syphilis, we have the complete destruction of the tissue in areas, for example, of the face. So babies can get syphilis from their moms, and here you have the destruction of the tissue around the skin. You can have it around the eyes. It can lead to blindness. So now, T. pallidum is able to evade the immune response by having antigenic variation, remember, changing the antigens on the surface of it. This is the one that goes around and gets a fibronectin coat. So now the antibodies that are able to attack the bacteria doesn't recognize fibronectin because it's now protecting itself in fibronectin, so you avoid recognition. So if you haven't had a chance, I would like you to do a little bit of research and check out the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. That is one of the most horrible um, chapters in American uh, health policy. During 40 years, they basically infected about 600 black men from Tuskegee in Alabama. And that let them have syphilis. Even when the treatment came in the 40s, they, did, they denied them treatment. So for 40 years, this man were, this black men were allowed to suffer from syphilis, pass it to their spouses and loved ones. So the spouses then pass it to their children, just on the name of, of American science. They did the same thing in Guatemala. They went to Guatemala and they, from 1946 to 1948, infected native Guatemalan populations in uh, rural areas with syphilis. But then at that point, they actually gave them antibiotics. They wanted to see how, to which state they could clear the infection. They didn't do it here with white people. They either went with the black people in America or they went abroad to do it with Indians in Guatemala. So I'll leave you with that. Um, I mean, these are some of the pictures of the people that you can see there. And I have one cartoon that I want you to read so you can look at the cartoon. At the end of this lecture, I have the slides for tuberculosis. So I want you to take a look about them and read them. And here's another slide for antigenic shift and also the slides for herpes. So I just took them out for the time issue. So I'll be seeing you next week on Tuesday.